Well, welcome back to another session of The Art of the Matter and to our last session focusing on the towering figure of Moses. He clearly is one of the most memorable and definitely the most significant of all the major figures in the Old Testament. As a portion of our lectionary text puts it, since then no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land, for no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So we come to this fateful moment when the Lord meets Moses on Mount Nebo. You can see it's indicated by green stars on the right and left maps, a red X in the middle map. So the Lord meets him and in a counterclockwise supernatural vision, allows him to see north as far as Dan, which is circled in red, south through Ephraim and Judah and the Negev, with a glimpse of the Mediterranean Sea in passing, and north again to Jericho, roughly opposite Mount Nebo. Then, as our reading continues, the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I've let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. The implication is that the Lord himself buried Moses, and the burial place was hidden so that it would not become a shrine and a source of idolatry to the Israelites. We've been looking at the life of Moses for two months, since August 23rd, to be exact. And I have to tell you that he has really gotten under my skin. It's almost as if I feel like I know him, like we've been through a lot together. When I first sat down to put this video together, I was actually in tears as I thought about Moses being granted this amazing vision of the land he had dreamed of and worked toward all his life, that he could see it but not be able to enter it with the people he had led through every imaginable difficulty for 40 years. It just struck me as infinitely sad. Moses even tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 3 that he pleaded with the Lord, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country, and Lebanon. But the Lord, he says, was angry with him and would not listen. I guess recalling the incident at the rock where Moses struck it instead of speaking to it and made it sound as though he and Aaron were producing the water and not the Lord. That is enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me any more about this matter. He tells Moses that he will let him see the land, but now he must commission Joshua, encourage and strengthen him, because it is he who will lead the people into the promised land, not Moses. I think anyone who has invested themselves in a long-term project, be it professional or personal, like a relationship, who's worked hard on it through thick and thin, dreamed that one day all that personal investment would bear fruit, anyone who has fully invested themselves in this way can imagine how Moses must have felt when the realization actually dawned that he would not be allowed to see the project through to completion, that someone else would be the one to realize the dream. Yes, it's wonderful that the goal of entering the promised land is in sight, and he can rest assured that he's been faithful in all that he has undertaken to bring the project so near to completion. But how bittersweet a moment is this. Moses can find enormous satisfaction in all he has done but deep personal sorrow that he'll not be the one to see it through to the end. We'll speak more about this in a moment. 
But for now, let's just take a look back at some of the events we've studied during our time with Moses. We'll call it Moses' greatest hits. First, of course, his birth, being rescued from the Nile by Pharaoh's daughter. He'll spend roughly the first 40 years of his life as an Egyptian prince, learning the ways of the Egyptians. Then, in this fresco from Botticelli, we saw a combination of a number of events of Moses' early life. His slaying of the Egyptian in the first panel, then a second attempt to interfere in an argument between two of his own fellow Israelites, and in the third panel, we see him fleeing Egypt and heading to the backside of the desert. When he's in the desert of Midian, he encounters the daughters of Jethro, who are trying to water their father's flocks but are being molested by some shepherds. Moses drives them away, assists with watering the flocks, and subsequently marries one of these daughters. After 40 years in the desert, Moses encounters God at the burning bush and learns what it is to stand in his presence. You have to take off your shoes because the very ground you are standing on is holy. Finally, following the Lord's command after a lot of initial resistance, he finally leads his family and others out of the desert and back to Egypt, where he will meet up with his own people, the Israelites, again, and convince them to throw off the yoke of slavery to Pharaoh and embark on a journey to the Promised Land. All of those events encompassed in a single fresco. We looked at the plagues the Lord sent upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians as Pharaoh repeatedly refused to let the Israelites go until the last plague where the firstborn male of every Egyptian family, including the firstborn males of the flocks and herds, all animals, will die as the angel of death passes over, but spares all the Israelites who have marked their doors with the blood of a slaughtered lamb. At last, Pharaoh frees the people, but no sooner have the Israelites departed than Pharaoh has second thoughts and decides to pursue them with horses and chariots. Moses and the Israelites are able to cross the Red Sea on dry land while the army of Pharaoh is engulfed by the water. Two weeks ago, we considered the episode of the Golden Calf. Moses, you'll remember, had been gone for 40 days on Mount Sinai, where the Lord was instructing him and giving him the Ten Commandments to share with his people. While he was away, the Israelites grew impatient and had Aaron make a golden calf for them to worship. The Lord sends Moses back down to confront the idolaters who are feasting and dancing and generally rebelling against everything that the Lord has stipulated in the covenant he had desired to make, which would bind the Israelites and the Lord together in a unique and intimate relationship. You see Moses and Joshua on the far left, with Moses hurling the stone tablets down in sorrow and disgust at what the people have done. There's a fantastic painting of Moses on the point of throwing down the tablets, which I really want you to see before we conclude our study of Moses. It's by Rembrandt, and of all the artists I can think of, it is Rembrandt who I think can best capture the emotions Moses felt at this moment and point us toward the complex mix of emotions he must have felt when surveying the promised land on Mount Nebo. Rembrandt painted this at a very low point in his life, just about the same time he painted this self-portrait. First, he had lost his wife Saskia to illness, as well as a number of children who didn't survive childhood. Then he went through bankruptcy in 1956, 1956, excuse me, 1656, and was forced to sell virtually all of his possessions. The second great love of his life, Hendrika Stoffels, had just given birth to a child by Rembrandt. He had been unable to marry her because of certain stipulations in his first wife's will, so Hendrika was promptly hauled before the church, charged with committing the acts of a whore with the painter Rembrandt, and barred from ever receiving communion again. Basically, she was excommunicated. 
Rembrandt didn't realize enough money from the sale of all his goods to pay off his debts. So he and his small family had to sell the impressive mansion he had bought years before when he was flush with success and take up very humble lodgings in a much poorer area of Amsterdam. So Rembrandt had been through a lot when he painted this image of Moses. It's an impressively large canvas, roughly five and a half by four and a half feet, and it takes on an epic quality since the figure of Moses with the huge tablets above his head is so big. He so fills the canvas and the background is indeterminate. Nothing distracts us from this central figure. And Moses seems to possess a light all his own. His face glows just as it was said to glow after he had been in the presence of the Lord. And the sleeves of his raised arms reflect that brightness. But it's the expression on his face that absolutely stops me in my tracks. If ever the expression more in sorrow than in anger could be represented, this is how I imagine it would look. There's nothing fierce, violent, or angry here. His face just seems to express an infinite sadness, as though his heart has been broken. I don't know about you, but for me, this image of Moses captures something of the emotions I think Moses experienced as he surveyed the promised land standing on Mount Nebo. He knows that it is due to his own sinful actions that he'll not be allowed to enter Canaan. He's accepted that, but still, it must hurt. That's my take on it, but then I tend a bit toward melancholy. So perhaps Moses didn't feel or look this way at all at that moment. Part of our lectionary reading is Psalm 90, which is said to be the prayer of Moses, the man of God. And perhaps it gives us Moses' larger perspective on life, beyond his own personal sorrow or disappointment at not being able to enter the promised land. It begins, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So in the final analysis, Moses says, a real dwelling place is and always has been in God. Although we may yearn as he did for a promised land during our earthly existence. The psalm continues, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has gone by, or like a watch in the night. He speaks more about the brevity of life and how the terrifying anger of the Lord at our sin can consume us in an instant. And he draws a lesson from this. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may get a heart of wisdom. In other words, keep this larger perspective and value each moment of our brief span of years. The psalm concludes with a plea. May the favor of our Lord God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So, although Moses might feel huge disappointment in not being allowed to enter the promised land, he also knows that his real home is in God, who alone determines the beginning and the end of our lives, and who alone can assure that our work, whatever it might be, is not in vain. The fresco we looked at last week, showing Moses seated and reading the law to the Israelites, actually shows five scenes occurring at the end of Moses' life, so we'll turn back to it now. At Moses' feet there on the right, you'll see the Ark of the Covenant containing the second stone tablets of the law that Moses received on Sinai, as well as a bowl of the manna which sustained the Israelites in the wilderness. 
The next scene shows Moses conferring his authority to, to Joshua, commissioning him to lead the Israelites forward. Here we see an angelic figure representing the Lord, giving Moses a panoramic vision of the entire promised land. And subsequently, we see Moses and Joshua descending the mountain together. Finally, we see that Moses has died and his body is stretched out and being mourned by Joshua, who kneels at his feet, together with several other Israelites. Of course, this isn't exactly accurate, as we know that Moses was alone with the Lord when he died, and nobody knew the place of his burial. But Signorelli wants to show that Moses did, in fact, die and was mourned by his people. And so ends the life of Moses the greatest figure of all the leaders and prophets in the Old Testament. Next Sunday is All Saints Day, and I thought we might take a look at the Ghent altarpiece, and particularly the panel which is known as the Mystic Adoration of the Lamb. Saints, martyrs, hermits, angels, knights on horseback, pilgrims of every stripe converge to worship the Lamb of God. And I thought that might be an appropriate way to enter into the celebration of all the saints who have preceded us. I hope you'll be able to join me. In the meantime, be well, be blessed, and see you next week.